want to thank all of you for coming. Really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me today. So my name is Jessica Norris. I am the owner and proprietor of Doobie Doobie Doo. If you've not been to my booth, um, I'm at booth 327 and I am the aromatherapy jewelry woman. Uh, I sell these gorgeous aromatherapy bracelets as seen in the middle. Um, they will instantaneously change the way you feel by providing you a personal oil diffuser. That's not why I'm speaking to you today, but I do have a confession. Um, this is an aromatherapy class, and I am not going to try and sell you an essential oil kit. So if you came here thinking that I was gonna try and push a kit on you, I'm really sorry, this is really just informative. So, uh, just I wanna just tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I received a PhD in chemistry from the University of Virginia in 2008, uh, it, which make, considering, that, if you do the numbers, I was really only five years old when this happened. No. Um, I have over 15 years experience in, as a research scientist in analytical chemistry and biology. Uh, so I, it was my, I've always loved science, always loved it as a kid. Um, I'm, I'm an analytical thinker. Um, research is very, very important to me. And I have authored several uh, journal articles uh, numerous publications, I've been a part of numerous publications, numerous studies, a lot of peer-reviewed scientific journals. I've presented my findings not just in the United States, but in Europe. Um, and I'm part of a science family. My husband also has a PhD in chemistry. His background is in natural products. So he kind of got me thinking on this path to natural products and plant extracts. Uh, he has quite a bit of research experience in that. He's on about 15 or 20 journal publications for that. So uh, together we're kind of a powerhouse and he helps me out as much as possible. Um, but more importantly, these, this is in purple because this is more, this, these are the more important aspects of, of me. Uh, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, my family's everything to me. Uh, I'm also the caregiver of a mother with multiple sclerosis and I'm a caregiver to a child with autism. And I myself have been uh, more recently diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So um, these are all things that affect me, but they shape me. Yes, they're all you know, um, issues of adversity, but they, they have shaped me into who I am today. And it really shapes my approach to aromatherapy and aromatherapy education. So think of me as a Venn diagram. If you're all keeping score, that's me in the middle. All three shall meet. And again, I've, I've described how I'm a scientist, how I'm an analytical thinker. I'm very logical. I'm a problem solver, I'm analytical, I'm all about the science. But am I all about the science because I'm also a caregiver? I'm compassionate, I'm empathetic, and I am understanding. I get it, I get why you're all sitting here, you're all looking for answers. I understand why these expos are so important because everybody's looking for an answer outside of what conventional medicine can provide us. And I'm looking for it too, I'm a, I'm a believer in in some medications in conventional medicine, but I'm also a believer in alternative methods because I'm a patient and I understand. I, I have to pay my insurance bill every year. I see what my MS drugs cost. We're talking about sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars a year, and that's just for one medication. Um, I'm health conscious. I'm searching for answers, just like all of you. And so it's these three things together that have really shaped the way that I teach aromatherapy and how I'm going to teach aromatherapy in the future. And that's what I provide to you today. I'm providing you a different approach to aromatherapy education. One that is based on clinical evidence, which we see a lot of, and scientific research, which we don't see a lot of, from the perspective of someone who understands. And this is not something that you can find very often. Often it is the aromatherapy education is provided by one or the other, but not both. And that's what I'm providing you to you today. So you're all really lucky to be in here today with me. Um, so again, it's all about convincing why you ask yourself, why haven't essential oils made it to the medical mainstream yet? Here, I'm gonna give you a very brief overview of why that is. There's a high demand because of, because essential oils are increasing in usage, uh, you know, across, uh, across the country. There's a high demand for scientific explanations to explain essential oil efficacy and how well they work. Um, this is in order for, for the medical mainstream to even be on board with essential oil usage. Um, the problem is that there's a narrow 
definition of proof that qualifies as valid science. This is a, here's, I'll give you a really good example. So it's been, it's been shown through clinical experience, time and time again, that lavender heals burns. I refer you back to one of the original publications of aromatherapy called Aromatherapy by Gattafoss. This was in 1937. And he wrote about how he used lavender to treat some severe burns that he received in the laboratory. And, you know, this is the first use of the term aromatherapy that exists. And so this is knowledge. You know that lavender heals burns. But we ask yourself, why is this not a scientifically valid point? Why, is the, why doesn't a doctor prescribe lavender to heal your burns? And the answer is this. There is no research. And I'm making the distinction between uh, clinical experience and scientific research. There is not a single journal publication that proves that lavender heals burns. Therefore, the implication in the medical mainstream is that lavender does not heal burns because there is no research. And that is the mindset of the medical community. And here's why. It's a very complex issue. It's not just, well, why can't they just do it? It's very complex, and, and I'll break it down for you like this. The, um, the way that, that modern science, is, the, the methods of modern science are built around scientific reductionism. And that is that, that states that every process in nature, chemical, biological, and physical, can be broken down into singular parts and can be described scientifically, the exact opposite of holistic, okay? Um, so therefore, a reductionist experiment that scientists would perform can only one variable is allowed to change at a time. Well, the problem is, is that essential oils have multiple components that works synergistically or with one another to provide you with a remedy. So the multiple components contribute to this curative effect. Well, in the scientific community, this, because there's multiple components and they work off the reductionist system where you're breaking it down into singular parts, each of these experiments will be, have to be performed with one variable changing at a time for every single component, which makes the number of experiments completely unmanageable. And therefore, with the medical mainstream, we have to assume that there is one active ingredient that provides the curative effect, when this simply may not be the case. It could be a number of the components that are in an essential oil that contribute to the curative effect. And using our lavender experiment, number of components may be contributing to the fact that lavender heals burns. But despite our limitations in the scientific community, there have been a number of really important experiments that have been done over the, over the past 50 or so years that have provided us with some very important information. Uh, we take a look at anti antibacterial uh, activity. This has been continuously researched since the 1880s. Um, we see that the number of essential oils inhibits bacterial growth or kills bacteria outright. This is published. This is published information. Um, most of these experiments, and in fact all of these experiments have been done in vitro, which means that they have been done uh, in nothing more than petri dishes. Balache uh, in France have given the most comprehensive studies to date. That's in the 1970s. Um, that's, that was dismissed by the medical community because it was written in French for no other reason. Uh, if it's not written in English, it must not be valid. Luckily for us, that's not the case anymore. Um, antifungal activity has been, um, has been more recently described in the 60s and 70s. There were a number of studies done, the most important or the most notable by, um, by these two gentlemen that uh, looked at the efficacy against fungi and yeasts in vitro, again, in little petri dishes um, done in the 60s and 70s. And I want to point out the importance of, of, of this when I say in vitro and in petri dishes. When you do a scientific experiment in a petri dish, it's completely different than doing it in a human being, okay? Just because it works in one does not mean it's going to work in a human. But it's, but you, but 
it's on the right track. And so we look to now anti-inflammatory activity. Um, and you can do some reading on this if you like, but there's, um, it's been shown and proven that German chamomile is very, very effective for uh, anti-inflammatory activity. Um, this was shown not within a human being or in vivo, but ex vivo. So they've done this outside of a human being, but in human tissue. And it, the studies prove um, that it works very well. So then we look at antiviral activity. And this really came to the forefront in the 1980s when the AIDS crisis was at the peak of its epidemic. Uh, it was a hot button topic and a lot of money went into funding for uh, antiviral activity. Um, and so in, in 87, they showed some very promising research of essential oils working, um, working for uh, antiviral activity. Um, again, a lot of the work was done in Petri dishes in vitro, but, a, but some of it, this is the first time that we really see um, studies published in vivo in human beings in scientific research. Um, and that was how effective that a lot of essential oils were at treating herpes lesions. And so this is, this is groundbreaking research. It's very important for the medical mainstream to take it seriously. Um, we look at the autonomic nervous system and what a lot of people use essential oils towards, and that's anxiety. And that, that work was done in the 1970s, um, showing its effectiveness on anxiety and nervousness. So now we shift towards modern day research. And we, uh, we see that we're starting to look at essential oils and the, the, the use of essential oils for chronic and metabolic and hormonal diseases. Um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, a lot of you know about the, um, the cancer research, the anti-cancer research that was done on terpenoids. That showed a lot of promise. That made it to clinical trials, but no further than cl clinical trials, unfortunately. Um, another, um, in, uh, in the 2000s, another component was shown to be very effective for anti-inflammatory activity. Um, that's helichrysum. Um, and there's shown to be several essential oils uh, successful at the prevention of osteoporosis. This, uh, this was also published. Um, and what's near and dear to my heart is um, the recent, the very, very recent studies um, due to the now prevalence of ADHD and autism in uh, today's youth and how often it is being, um, being diagnosed. And that's the effect of essential oils on children with these disorders. And again, going back to the Venn diagram of me, um, I present to you, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm a caregiver for is my six-year-old son. He has recently been diagnosed with uh, level one autism spectrum disorder. Um, and so this, um, the latest statistics show is that it's one in 68 children that are being diagnosed. Um, for those of you that don't know anybody with autism, uh, it certainly puts these, ch these children are different. They're developing at different rates than non-autistic children. Um, they have different social and cognitive and physical development, um, or sometimes all three. Um, it is marked by children that have difficulty expressing emotion. Um, you often get meltdowns, temper tantrums. I've seen my share of those with, with my non-autistic child, and definitely my share of those with an autistic child. Um, they have different reaction to sensory stimuli, often leading to the same types of meltdowns and temper tantrums, just because they don't like the way something feels or tastes. Um, this was an interesting statistic. 80% of children with autism or aut that have autism spectrum disorder have trouble sleeping. And I know that when I have trouble sleeping, um, I get kind of cranky. Sometimes I have a little bit of a meltdown, right? That's why I drink coffee. Um, and so the key is if you get a better night's sleep, you're a happier, more well-adjusted human being. Same with autistic children, just on an exponential scale. And so um, to me, making sure that my son gets the best night's sleep possible has helped a great deal. And I'll tell you, these are the blends that, that I use at home for my son. You know, before I, before I say this, um, before I go through these, I'll say this has been done, you know, when you work with essential oils, it is trial and error. Everybody's different. Um, everybody reacts to stimuli differently. Everybody reacts to smells differently. 
Not everybody loves lavender. Uh, not everybody reacts well to certain things. And so um, just like no two non-autistic spectrum disorder children are alike, no two, ch no two people are alike, but no two, a no two is, you know, ASD children are alike. They don't have the same symptoms. Similar, but not the same. And so I've been playing around with different ratios of these oils that you see here to, um, to, help, to help my child out. And they even work to some extent for my non-autistic child. Um, and so I can't tell you enough how well the, the combination of lavender and Roman chamomile work for insomnia. Um, a lot of people just use Roman chamomile. I, particular, I don't particularly like the way it smells. And so um, I, I kind of do a one-to-one -one ratio or a little bit, eh, maybe I'll skew it sometimes. Um, I think the lavender really does work synergistically with, with Roman chamomile. Um, I have not had a sleepless night since, but I did in the hotel. Why? Because I didn't bring those oils with me. And I had a terrible night's sleep. Um, and it worked great for my son. And a good night's sleep for my son means less meltdowns the next day. Um, he hyperfocuses, and uh, as do many autistic children. And there have been a number of clinical studies that are going on right now with vetiver. Vetiver is a great oil. It's very, um, it's very similar to patchouli uh, in viscosity, in how thick it is, and and the smell. So. Um, you, the internet is full of information on the use of vetiver and how well it helps children focus. So if any of you have um, any interest in that. What was it called again? Vetiver. How do you spell it? V-E-T-I-V-E-R. Um, I've used oils for anxiety for him. Uh, I will use um, lavender and bergamot. I'll combine the two sometimes. It seems to calm him down. It's working from a, again, these are all working from a clinical aspect. These are working for my children. They're all safe to use. Um, sometimes he gets a bit nervous. Sometimes he has, has um, just nervous in, you know, in front of talking in front of people. Um, I, I, I show you this uh, focus and determination. It's from a company called Ameo. Um, I, am, I do not sell it. Uh, it just works really well for him. I don't know what the ingredients are. I know at least one of them is patchouli, um, but it, that, that, particular, that particular oil works for him. It may work for you, it may not. So having said all this, uh, I want to point out that there are, um, when, if you ever use essential oils for children, make sure they are safe to use for children. Um, there are uh, safety guides that are in publication. I urge you to take a look at it before you start an essential oil regimen on your children because some are not safe, especially for children uh, from the ages of zero to two. I'm sorry, is this consumption or aromatherapy? Arom aromatherapy. Okay. Um, and I am actually um, specifically not mentioning consumption for a reason. We can get to that, get to that in a minute if you want to talk about that later. Um, now, from a scientific research perspective, it's different than, than, than proving it empirically in a clinical setting. And by clinical, I mean I'm, I'm giving my son to, to inhale. Um, it's, it's a growing movement because autism is at the forefront of, a, of many, many minds. Again, a one in 68 diagnosis rate uh, in 2014. Um, it's a hot button topic, and so funding is going into the research of, of autism and, and, and ways to counter it. Um, ways to counter it that don't involve medicating a child. One of the biggest movements to research um, essential oils for autism is coming out of Ohio, the Ohio State University. Um, they've got an entire clinical trial set up that is really kind of what I believe is at the forefront of, um, of essential oil research for autism. Also, the Franklin Institute of Wellness is, uh, is wrapping up a clinical trial for the use of aromatic in inhalation in pediatric autistic patients. And so the clinical trials are ongoing. Um, there are a few articles out there from relevant publications, one out of behavioral neuroscience, sensory enrichment, which in their studies does include smell. It's not just about aromatherapy, this particular article. Um, may well be an effective therapy for the treatment of autism. 
This is the first published instance where we see scientific evidence for the use of essential oils in autism. Uh, Dr. Myla Emerald, um, who has been involved in essential oil research for many years, probably about two decades or so, uh, wrote an article uh, that lists a few essential oils that could be quite helpful for symptoms that are found in ASD and ADHD. So again, the number of patients and the number of instances that we're seeing of autism and the empirical proof that we see is really providing us the impetus and the need for more scientific research, again, for the medical community to take it seriously. So again, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I'm a caregiver of a, um, a mother with multiple sclerosis. I too have been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I've had symptoms for longer, but the official diagnosis came six years ago. And I'm still standing up, so must be doing okay. Um, it, but it is marked by, uh, marked by many, many different types of symptoms. Um, and again, just like autism spectrum disorder, no two MS patients are alike. But there are 400,000 established cases in the United States with a, an estimate of 10,000 new cases per year. For those of you that don't know about multiple sclerosis, it is an immune disorder. Um, the, your immune system is overactive and attacks the myelin sheath that protects your nerve cells. Um, and that results in inflammation and ultimately nerve damage. And that causes your physical ailments. And speaking of physical ailments, there's a broad, broad spectrum. Um, the most notably is vision vision problems, but pain, fatigue is a huge one. Um, impaired coordination, impaired balance, spasticity. Um, the best way to handle MS is to handle your stress. Um, if you can cope with your stress, you reduce the chances of having a flare-up. So I'm giving you an example, again, through trial and error, of things that have worked for me to counter these symptoms. Will they work for you? I don't know. It is a good starting point, right? Um, I know that there is quite a lot of information um, that basal helps, massaging with basal helps deal with muscle pain and spasticity. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Again, is it, scientific, is it in a scientific journal? No. Um, for headaches and also good for season, seasonal allergy sufferers is a one to one to one combination and I've seen this a lot of lemon, la lemon, lavender and peppermint. If you dilute it down you can use it at the temples. Helps with sinus inflammation but it's very effective towards headaches uh, which is something that I personally get a lot of and can be attributed to my MS. Insomnia, uh, I've already spoken about, lav my, I'm a big fan of lavender and Roman chamomile. Um, Stress, uh, I like to mix bergamot and clary sage together. That works for me a lot. Ylang ylang and lavender is great for stress, but I find, and I've had other clients talk to me um, when they use that combination, you can actually feel your heart rate drop. And so it does have sedative effects, and I think it's a lot more effective than uh, using just, just lavender on itself. I think, this is just a theory based on, the end of the few people that I've talked to is that they work synergistically uh, to, uh, to really provide a sedative effect for people. So uh, if you're stressed and driving, that may not be the best combination for you. Um, rose, terrific for stress, but a very expensive oil, unfortunately. Um, inflammation, uh, I've spoken about German chamomile. There are articles that talk about German chamomile that's based off the um, based off the studies that were performed that I spoke about recently. And uh, fatigue, any time that you combine a citrus oil with a mint really wakes you up, wakes up your senses. Um, I find my two favorite is the combination of spearmint and lime. And I love to use that in the summertime. That is a great one to use in the summertime. Um, and orange and peppermint, that's terrific to use in the coming winter months. And so whenever you combine those two really provides like like the first thing that really that you smell are the citrus notes and then the peppermint lets it last a bit longer. So again, I research it through other people's usage. I research through I research it through um, journal articles as much as I can because there's 
there's not enough out there. And I'm a big advocate for having more of it out there. And I'm lucky enough, I'm lucky enough to have a doctor that I have an open communication with. Um, I, my, my specialist, my, my, my MS specialist is uh, out of the University of Virginia. And so it's a, it's a teaching hospital. And while they can't promote the use of specific essential oils, they are all for me using it. They do not say, no, don't use essential oils, use this medicine instead. I don't hear that from my doctor. But what I hear are the essential oils I should stay away from based on my condition. And I, she would like feedback on what I've, what I've experienced because maybe if enough people experience it, there can be research about it and then the medical community can take it seriously. There's very little in the scientific literature about essential oils and MS. And again, considering how the number of patients is growing per year and how many, how many are patients are worldwide, not even the United States, worldwide, um, this is a shame because they're helping me. The National Center for Biotechnology Technology Information um, provides hope. So they may give symptomatic relief. There is one journal article in the compl complementary therapies in nursing and, mid and midwifery uh, about the use of massage and aromatherapy for pain management. Again, it's not for MS patients though. But the scientific articles just aren't there and they need to be. So that's where I come in. In 2018, opening an aromatherapy institute. I'm gonna be partnering with my husband who has natural products experience. I'll, it'll be online. Uh, I'm hoping to get out and do as many lectures as possible, lectures like this. It'll be education based on science and clinical evidence. I am constantly looking for journal articles and clinical evidence to report back. Um, when, when this part of the business is up and running, there'll be social media updates on research. And again, it's using the way that I am through my Venn diagram as a caregiver, as a scientist, as a patient myself, my sp specifically different approach to aromatherapy education. This is not about selling you a kit. This is not about selling you oils that you may or may not need. This is about educating you in how to use these oils safely and the most efficiently. I'll be, I'll be providing updates on essential oil research as fast as I possibly can. I'm gonna have podcasts, I'm gonna have a blog, a lot of safety resources because I think that the safe use of essential oils is paramount. Not just what your young living rep tells you or your doTERRA rep tells you, but what somebody that knows <laughs> the safety implications of using essential oils, it tells you. And yeah, I'm still gonna sell my bracelets. Um, you know, I'm, I'm also hoping to write a book, but right now, at my booth, I have bracelets. They're, they're beautiful, you get the energy of the gemstone that you have on your bracelet, combined with the use of aromatherapy lava stone beads. So uh, please, if you haven't had the chance to stop by my booth, come on down. Even if you're not gonna purchase a bracelet, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you about what you'd like to learn in an online institute. Um, the idea is to um, provide modular coursework and then eventually um, certification coursework for continuing education for massage therapists. So if you'd like more information, there is every feasible way to get in touch with me. I really want to thank you all for your attention. I'll leave you with this quote, um, and you may have seen it before. The greatest medicine of all is to teach people how not to need it. And this is true, but we have to do it safely and with the greatest amount of research possible, we can convince the medical community to get on board. And thank you for your attention. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, sure. The best, in your opinion, the best diffuser is a nebulizer, or what do you think? Or is there something? The if you're trying to get the beneficial aspect, like the therapeutic health aspect. Sure, and it's depending on 
what you're trying, what ailment you're trying to handle. You know, the best diffuser is really going to be. I mean, are you asking, is it better to diffuse versus topically apply? Or are you are you asking? Sure. And so, great. And so, are you? Um, is it a respiratory? If it's a respiratory issue, or if it's sleep, diffusing works great. Um, if it's uh, if it's something where you need help with um, joint joint problems, you're going to want to look into topical applications. I am not against taking essential oils internally if it's done properly. And and. I do not believe that you should just put lemon oil in your water just because a rep says it's okay. You really have to read up on each particular essential oil. How much is safe? What dilutions are safe? I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yes. I have a question along those lines. Sort of sure. Like how, um, how much or how little um, are you breathing this in, or are you rubbing on you, et cetera? I mean, is that something you have to research as well? Very good, that's a very good question, and it's a very important question. Um, and, and again, it's gonna be based on the oil. The general rule is a 1% dilution on your skin. And I don't think anybody, without knowing that, is doing that. Um, there are instances where people are taking citrus oils, orange, lemon, grapefruit, and putting it on their skin neat, and then they go out in the sun. And you blister, and it hurts. And it's phototoxic. Now, does that mean everything should be diluted down to 1%? No, and that's when, um, there are research guides that are available, and you really have to consult them. And to date, I've been to a number of talks where um, it's, a, it's a direct marketing company providing education. I've not heard one person say you should refer to a reference guide. I've not, and I'm telling you that's very important because when you hear one and two percent on your skin, and especially basil, basil is another one, you can't just put that on your skin neat. You can get burnt, you can have adverse effects, this stuff's going into your system. It could be systemic, and so you really have to practice caution. Um, as far as diffusing aromatically, um, again, it depends on the diffuser you're using. Um, it's more of a how, it's more of a length of time that you should be diffusing it as well. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely shouldn't be dumping a whole bottle in, well, in a, with a couple of drops of water. That's not the idea, but it's also, um, a lot of times you'll read the label and you'll say you can only do it for 15 minutes at a time. I mean, you've got to pay attention to the labels and some essential oil companies, to, to the credit of the direct marketing um, oil companies, they at least have it on their labels. Sometimes you don't even see it on the labels. And so with, with the, with the le lesser quality ones. And so um, again, pay attention to directions. And get, that, get that reference guide. If you're serious about using essential oils, get the reference guide. Yes? What there is one, there's a few out there, but the Bible of, uh, of essential oil safety is called Essential Oil Safety by Robert Tisserand. Could you repeat that, please? Essential Oil Safety by Robert Tisserand. T-I-S-S-E-R-A-N-D, I think. So. No, to ask away. I've got the rooms. So. When you um, talk about, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's either or, but how, how do some of these, do you have to also check in how they interact with different medications that you might be on or your son might be on? Or? You, you absolutely hit the nail right on the head, and that is why I am not promoting internal use is because of drug-drug interactions. Because effectively, you know, we, we use the term chemical-free loosely. Plant extracts are a chemical. Everything's made of chemicals. Everything has, is made of chemicals. And so this could interact with a drug. And again, if you're not in communication, if you're on medications for a chronic, chronic illness or anything chronic, if you're continuously on a medication, um, or even not, even if it's for a short duration, 
and you are an essential lawyer user, user you should be in communication with your doctor about this. Make sure that there's no, inter there's no issues, known issues. Um, again, um, because of the growing movement towards essential oil use, that's another reason why research is so important because people are taking this, not talking to their doctors, and they're on medications. The doctor doesn't know that you're taking it, let alone whether there's, there may be an interaction. Um, so if that answers your, I, I know that's so not an answer, but it's an answer. So that's not uh, breathing it or your oil, that's well, taking it. Yeah, internally is, is the okay. internally is the the one where you, it, it sends up some red flags. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That does not mean that you can't take any internally. Mm -hmm. But I'm not. I can't stand here and 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 advocate for something that if I don't know what what medication you're on, I can't tell you that you can take it. So I go. Don't you know? I, yeah. What exactly is an essential oil? What? See, uh, well, it's the extract of the plant. Uh, it, you know, provides you with um, the aroma, if you will. Um, there are other constituents to the plant, but through the distillation process, you can extract that specifically out of the plant. Usually through steam dis distillation or cold pressed extraction. So the oil is actually something that's added to the essence, or, or does it come out as an oil? It comes out as, uh, as an oil, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's the, res it's the result, yes. So uh, is it oil is different than water? Absolutely. Water yes. would that's great. Right, this is not a fragrance. There is a definite difference between essential oils and fragrances. And, and, and aromatherapy is not used. The benefits of aromatherapy are, that I speak of today are not by what is labeled as a fragrance on the market. Does that make sense? Because there's additives in fragrances. Well, no, no, I was actually referring to more like there's oil and there's water. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. uh, essential oil is basically a cold press. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the technique used to, remo to extract it out of the plant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Would it be beneficial to use strictly organic oils because you're using non-organic oils of the plant? It takes all chemicals into Absolutely. the plant. Mm -hmm. So then you're burning up using and that's, an, and that's another very good point. Um, you know, just like some people eat non-organic food, it happens. Uh, you can use non-organic plants um, to, to make essential oils, and it happens. Um, and that's why it's very important when you choose an essential oil company um, to look at the processes that they use to make their, um, to make their oils. Uh, let's say I'll use Young Living as an example. Um, they, have a, they explain every detail how it's made. They're very proud of how they make it. It's one of their selling points. Um, they own the farms. They tell you about the process that they use to make it. Um, they let you visit the farms if, if, if you so desire. Um, another way to tell uh, a quality essential oil is through um, the purity testing, which is called gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Uh, these should be made available for any, for any oil that you purchase, and it is what scientists use to analyze the essential oil and how pure it is. Does that make sense? So um, these, these reports should be made available. They are available with some of the higher priced oils. Um, I can't speak for every oil company, but um, that's a, that's a good question to ask when, when you decide on, because most people, they become uh, brand specific, and that's fine. Um, and so that's one of the questions that you should be upfront. Well, does this oil company provide analysis pages, GCMS analysis pages, to present their purity? Thank you guys so much for coming, um, and enjoy the rest of the expo. Thank you. Thank you.